Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome everyone on board. Uh, we had uh, started uh, to discuss uh, this theme of uh, opioid free anesthesia. So, yesterday I just <laughs> discussed a basic concept uh, about uh, opioid free anesthesia. And we discussed some of the problems, complications which are uh, there. And actually, we don't consider these problems because we think that uh, they, it has to be happen. Like if we, we are giving anesthesia, um, we always indifferently are giving opioids. Even people who are giving <clears throat> central nerve block, even they are adding, whenever possible, they are adding fentanyl or morphine or whatever. Okay. So actually, we, we are so uh, habitual. Actually, we as an anesthetist, we are ourselves uh, addicted to opioids. In a way that we we think that we cannot give anesthesia without an opiate, so it's you can say a totally different concept. Okay, and uh, for that, first of all, you should be knowing what are the problems which you can face when you are using opiates in your practice. And uh, the second uh, thing thing will be that what will be the the other alternatives and what are the problems you can face when you are using those medications because there is no because there are even there are not much studies uh, who have who, which are being done uh, in all uh, like uh, you can say patient groups surgical groups uh, and uh, which which uh, is the a better choice of uh, using the agent okay so these are the limitations uh, which um, like it's still underway and still there are people in the world who are uh, who don't believe that we can have anesthesia without opioids okay so um, we will just continue our uh, discussion with that regard so uh, um, first of all i will just start with one of the agent uh, which is uh, being used for uh, like uh, in a number of surgeries where we are avoiding uh, opioids that one of them is uh, IV lidocaine, okay? So lidocaine is being used. All of us are familiar that we are giving a bolus of lidocaine to blunt the, the stress response of laryngoscopy. Uh, majority people are using it. Even they, uh, they are aware, aware of that thing. Uh, but if I ask them that the same stress is there, throughout the surgery and wanna, why not to use it as an infusion so this is not familiar to everyone okay so in in the number of surgeries uh, even if you are if you have given opioids this lidocaine is being used as, constantly through as an infusion okay and even continued in the post operative period according to the the stress of the surgery and of course because lidocaine toxicity has to be considered uh, if the patient has got any certain specific heart blocks or certain arrhythmias in which you cannot give lidocaine. Okay. And of course, my, as I told uh, that uh, this metabolism, that if liver is not functioning, then lidocaine uh, may accumulate and there can be some problems with it. But usually, if you are giving in a low dose, uh, the dose is roughly around 0.5 to 2 milligram per kg per hour, 0.5 to 2 milligram per kg per hour to be continued throughout the surgery and reduced as the, the, the surgical stimulus is gone and now you are uh, like having less uh, requirement, okay? So it has a potent anti-inflammatory, anti-hyperalgesic. Hyperalgesia is uh, like a, uh, in, is a phenomena by which the pain sensation ha is increased. And actually, opioids are one of the uh, uh, drugs which are actually causing uh, uh, or which can cause hyperalgesia. Okay. S similarly, with reference to um, use of uh, opioids in gastrointestinal surgery, because they will cause more ileus. And uh, after so much manipulation, already there is a risk factor that the patient can have ileus and these patients, if they are not getting uh, adequate intake and adequate uh, fluid replacement, 
so there 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 is hypokalemia in almost majority of the cases and then uh, if you are giving a lot of opioids then it is creating problem so it is also uh, a pro peristaltic drug okay so there is level 1 evidence from gastrointestinal surgery demonstrate decrease pain decrease pain scores let's say in scores opioid analgesic consumption and side effects iv lidocaine is useful acute pain agent to an, achieve enhanced recovery after surgery so it is a major component to be used when we are thinking about enhanced recovery after surgery eras protocol is being used in majority of surgeries now even eras protocol they are using in uh, in obstetric surgery orthopedic surgery uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery so actually it is and uh, now it it is it was it started with one few of the surgery but now they are there are protocols they are chalking out in every almost every surgery okay uh, acute pain service experience confirms that with careful patient selection appropriate monitoring and nursing policies lidocaine infusion may be safely at continued for several days after operation so this is something it it is on, not only being used in the intraoperative period it is also may be continued in post operative period Okay, in the role of analgesic adjuvant in perioperative pain management, notably ketamine, lidocaine, and gabapentin uh, continues to be explored. It is still uh, like uh, this article was published in 2016, actually. Uh, it is uh, from BJ Education. So, sure. Okay, so that's what I was telling you. So, lid lidocaine, uh, uh, necessary for analgesia in the perioperative period is 1 to 2 mg per kg as an initial bolus, followed by a continuous infusion of 0.5. They are mentioning to 3 mg per kg, but actually, like uh, uh, usually, it is not required more than 2 mg per kg per hour. Okay, and lidocaine has a high hepatic extraction ratio and its metabolism depends not only on a hepatic metabolic capacity, but also on hepatic blood flow. A continuous metabolic capacity, uh, sorry, will take uh, four to eight hours to achieve a steady state plasma concentration. On discontinuation, after prolonged infusion, the uh, plasma level decreases rapidly. So context sensitive sensitivity Half time for a three day infusion of lidocaine is 20 to 40 minutes. So it does not accumulate over time. So context sensitive half life is, uh, is with reference to the continuous uh, use of, uh, uh, of the medications. And when we are giving an infusion, how, in how much time their uh, effect weans off. Okay. So this concept is being used for uh, opioids as well, like ramifentanyl is is the shortest among the opioids so when you even if you have given for a long time if you close it it the effect will finish within three to five minutes okay similarly fentanyl though initially will uh, will have uh, like uh, the effect will be finished early but if you are giving in a prolonged uh, duration actually the the contact sensitive half-life becomes more and more because all the lipid uh, compartment will be overfilled and actually terminal half-life for fentanyl is equivalent to morphine if you are giving for a long time. So that's that's uh, you should be, be knowing. Okay. So, so yes. Yes. You want to say something? You want to say something? Okay, so all the concern with reference to another, and even this can be asked in MDQ, is what is when the plasma concentration of lidocaine exceeds 5 microgram per ml. Okay, this is the plasma concentration. This is not the dose. So this is important. So if the dose uh, is, uh, is given in a way, uh, not only the dose, cumulative and uh, levels. Okay, so... Uh, it begins more than 6 microgram per ml and it's quite definite at 10 microgram per ml. So initially there will be CNS symptoms uh, and then followed by uh, like uh, cardiac symptoms because 
this is the concept that uh, there is a concept of CNS versus uh, over CVS uh, toxicity. So lidocaine in lidocaine, CNS toxicity will uh, appear earlier than cardiac toxicity, while in bupicane actually this ratio is different and may, may cardiac toxicity will appear earlier. It can come together, but usually in, in CNS as there is lidocaine, the cardiac toxicity will appear late. Okay. And what will be those signs? Negative inotropy uh, greater in patients with conduction problems or after uh, myocardial infarction effects on conduction, prolonged PR interval, QRS duration, sinus tachycardia, sinus arrest. So that's what, of course, if you are using it, you should be knowing about it. So to be on safe side, usually you should not exceed 2 milligram per kg. Okay. I have not used it because I'm not uh, doing ICU now. But I have seen an, in, a, in a number of setups is being, it's being used. At least I can say for sure that in, uh, among, in the intraoperative period, it gives a wonderful effect. Even the MAC requirement will be decreased. Um, like uh, it, it is giving a very good result. I have used personally a number of times. And uh, uh, of course, it should be used with the syringe pump. But practically speaking, if you don't have the syringe pump, still the dose which you want to give in a certain period of time, you can put in the drip. Of course, you cannot mention this in uh, as a clinical, you need a lot of experience for that thing. Uh, at least in adults, if you are putting, for example, 60 milligram and you are titrating according to the effect, usually the, any, any uh, fluid, if you are giving, it will not finish in uh, uh, like less than 15 minutes if you are not pushing it or flushing it. So you can you can calculate accordingly according to, and you can uh, titrate according to the response, okay? At least for the initial period of uh, in anesthesia, you can do it till the time you get a, get a plateau, okay? And of course, whenever you are using uh, such medication, uh, you should have, first of all, uh, a good concept of what you are doing number one and number two of course you should be giving other because you know uh, i repeat this thing that sometimes we forget that there is one special uh, uh, component in almost every component of pain is somatic so if you start your pain medications with paracetamol non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory drugs and local infiltration of the NCN, that will give you a big margin unfortunately we don't do it if we just try to do it because once the NCN has been given and now if you are I'm talking about specifically at the moment about uh, abdominal surgery, okay? So once they have reached inside, they have cut the skin and now they are in the muscles and they have retracted the muscles and now they are more, whatever they are doing it is in the gut. So now majority component of pain at that time is visceral pain, okay? So usually visceral pain will not create that much problem. The other thing will be with reference to maintenance of the other part of the anesthesia. Like you should be giving very good muscle relaxation. Okay. And even you, you try this thing that your patient is comfortable. Suddenly you happen to change the position of the tube. Like you slightly pull or push or, or another very practical aspect. Someone asked you to put NG tube. The patient is comfortable. Heart rate is comfortable. And now you started putting NG tube. And you will come to know that suddenly the heart rate and blood pressure will go up. And this is this is also a lesson for you that at that time, the other stimulations are not adding anything much uh, with reference to the challenge of controlling the pain. Okay, Because when the abdomen is open and they are doing it, the, the comp miserable component is more. Okay, So you just have to, like for example, if you want to do and G, you should, at that time, you should try to increase the depth of anesthesia because once you will try to push the NG or another thing you can do that you can take a lidocaine spray and what we do only, we just put a jelly on it. And as soon as we put the jelly, we put it. So if we want to have a good anesthesia, we should either, we should spray the oropharynx a little bit with the lidocaine spray. And if you are, approaching from the nasal, uh, uh, like in, uh, uh, you are putting, not not putting oro, oro gastric tube, you are putting nasal gastric tube. It is better you put some uh, decongestant, then you put lidocaine jelly inside and give few seconds at least, at least one minute 
for its effect to, to, to take place. And then you try because unfortunately we are not putting lidocaine for the effect of lidocaine. We are putting lidocaine only as a as a lubricant. So if you want don't want its effect, you should use uh, any lubricant like KY jelly. Why you are putting lidocaine? Because it's useless if you are not giving uh, sufficient time. Okay, so I hope you understand my point. This is practical aspect. So that, that whenever you are anesthetizing a patient, you should have a concept of what you are doing. Okay, so you can have on this uh, specific uh, protocol of this Ottawa hospital, which they have chalked out. And uh, in the, because usually we don't have uh, such system, even, even in the hospital where I'm working, unfortunately, not much of the people uh, are accepting this board of anesthesia. Okay, but uh, these days I I have used a lot of lidocaine in the in the intraoperative period, not as postoperative because for that you need a, a, a full full system which is supporting you. Okay, otherwise you will have problem because if you don't uh, the the other people don't know what you you are doing, this can create big problems. Okay, so of course that's why opiate free anesthesia is not uh, like uh, you can say. Uh, and not even you will not find in majority of uh, in the textbook you will not even find this word over there okay but it's a wonderful technique okay so you can have uh, this uh, uh, this article you can read about it okay so uh, alternative to regional anesthesia epidural so you you can of course you can chalk out certain patient groups in which you can use it so any patient in which epidural is contraindicated for laparoscopic surgery, you don't need actually epidural. People are putting epidural without thinking that epidural, laparoscopic surgery ports are not that much. In, unless they are open in, opening it, there is no need for epidural. Okay, You are using a protocol for enhanced recovery after surgery protocol. Trauma, multiple significant injuries. So uh, you cannot give too much local. Okay, So you are trying to have something which is you are giving as a, an IV infusion. Okay, uh, then uh, post-operative, uh, sorry, opioid dependence or tolerance. So now you have to give uh, something which is uh, like uh, uh, other than opioids. Of course, because these if patients are tolerant, you need to give too much opioids. And if you are giving too much op opioids, the the signs, uh, the the uh, the complications will be more. The side effects will be more. Okay, uh, surgery at a site of chronic pain, previously experience of poorly controlled pain, substance abuse. And actually another thing is that the, uh, the, 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 the concept is that if you don't control acute pain in a multidimensional way, in a multidisciplinary way, okay, even if you are using opiates, still you can use lidocaine to, to reduce the use. It's not that like there is two concepts. One is opioid free anesthesia and one is opioid sparing anesthesia. Okay, So when you are using opioid sparing anesthesia, even that is that is perfect. If you and that's what actually we are doing by some way that when we are giving any any compartment block or any nerve block, actually we are reducing the requirement of opiates. If you have placed an epidural for a laparotomy and you have started epidural infusion before, uh, even you have given a bolus, uh, you have given a bolus, and now you are continuing an infusion. Actually, you will the the, the requirement of opiates will be much reduced, and the problems which associated with opioids will 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 uh, will vanish okay so that is the concept of uh, using uh, certain medications okay so a uh, few words about uh, dexmedetomidine okay so dexmedetomidine is alpha 2 agonist okay so whenever there is pain there is sympathetic stimulation and actually uh, brain is responding with as a response as a as a stress response uh, there is tachycardia and there is uh, increased sympathetic discharge so the mechanism of uh, dexmedetomidine is presynaptic in the central nervous system and it is actually uh, doing a sympathetic analgesic and sedative effects okay so make it an attractive option for maintenance of sedation in ICU uh, and in ICU with reference to ICU actually the selling point is that it does not cause respiratory depression okay so if you have a patient who 
who was receiving opioids like fentanyl or propofol or dizepam or midazolam for a long time and now you want to wean this patient so presidex will give an excellent uh, condition in which you weaning can be proceeded okay so now the problem is that because i am using it personally uh, the dosage we would, which are written here actually this creates problem because if you have given uh, full fledged anesthesia only if you are using it as a separate conscious sedation then maybe the dose requirement will be higher but if you are using it uh, in addition to the normal anesthesia the problem is that this dose is too much okay this one microgram per kg over 10 minutes will create too much problems because what uh, what is my personal experience is that hardly 10 to maximum 20 mics will be more than enough because if you are using a combination like if you have if you have given uh, some paracetamol you have given NSAID you have given very small dose of ketamine like I what I do hardly believe me this is not one I think even not even 0.1 even 0.1 to 0.2 microgram per kg bolus is like bolus in the sense that similarly 10 minutes usually hardly I don't give more than 0.1 to 0.2 microgram per kg roughly okay so that 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 gives a good effect and actually after that this one this dose you can say the infusion dose usually what they have mentioned here 0.2 microgram uh, 0.2 to 1.4 microgram per kg per hour it makes sense why in the sense that that for example if you have given in a fast time what happens suddenly there will be bradycardia so like my suggestion or my advice will be that I don't know which patient group they have done this. But in my whatever experience I have uh, done, this dose of concept of loading dose is very dangerous because maybe in some patient nothing will happen. But if suddenly you have given over 10 minutes that much dose that like, for example, one microgram, at least 60 to because the total ampule is of 200 mics. So if you have given a lot Actually, you will have serious bradycardia, and uh, like that's I think that that is the thing by which actually there are incidents of prolonged bradycardia in the post-operative care unit, and then then it's become a big problem. Okay, so uh, if you reduce the dose, or you can say give the dose according to the surgical stimulus, according to the patient patient's baseline heart rate, and you know if you are giving less, you can increase it. But if you give more, it's, there is no way to pull it out of the body. Okay. So my suggestion will be that you gradually start at 0.1 and gradually you can increase it. Okay. Because what I'm, I'm just telling you my routine is not written anywhere. But I do that I put in adult around 10 mics in paracetamol. And by the time we are putting the monitors and we are, so by that time that uh, has already gone. Like by the time I start giving uh, induction agent, half of it is already gone. Okay. So it is giving me angelesis and very good result. Even majority of patients I have reduced even using midazolam, which I used to give in in uh, as a, as a preoperative angelesis. Okay. But still there are a lot of questions to be asked that whether if you, you can, you can, because another thing I will tell you, maybe this will come here in this article as well. Uh, Presidex, a number of people use it intranasal. So the dose requirement is more. Okay. But I have seen by using, by, by done by some of the resident who was doing some study on it, he was uh, putting a lot of dose. So what ha was happening that in, uh, he was doing it actually in pediatric patients. So what was the problem I faced? And, and, I, and then I actually, I had to stop him. Uh, I have to stop him to, to do this in after two cases that the patient were recovering uh, too much delay because the recovery profile with Presidex is that the, the baby or patient will be breathing, but will not opening eyes. Okay. So that's unwanted, especially in case of day surgery. If you are using, uh, uh, still I will tell you that Presidex, when if you are using in day surgery, you should be taking care of this thing. But if you, because if you use it in a small surgery, in a relatively higher dose, the recovery will be delayed. And I have faced multiple times this problem. If I had given 
a little more than what I what I should. So if you think that you are requiring still your patient is not comfortable, you can give your opiates. You can give uh, even if maybe the, the 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 small dose of beta blocker or according to the scenario. Okay, like for example, if you need to give too much uh, presidex in a small procedure, don't go for it. Okay, because uh, presidex recovery. Uh, if you give more, then recovery will be delayed for sure. Okay, so that is that is the the people who listen to me and if they try to use it, try to use it in a minimum dose. Try to get the results. And then you can gradually, you will come to know how to use it. Okay. So because this dose is crazy dose. I, I, I don't believe that any, any anyone should give this dose. Okay. So intravenous, multiple routes, oral use is limited by, by its extensive first pass metabolism. But if you are using in a way, it is it, its absorption can be fastened by mucosa. Especially if you, even if you are giving intranasal, absorption will be fast and then you are trying to give more so they, if it is absorbed more then it will create a problem that's what we face actually okay so metabolism is occurring in the uh, inactive metabolites to be excreted in the urine estimated context sensitive half-life of dexmedetomidine is between one to four hours thus the elimination half-life is similar uh, following a single dose or infusion of more than 24 hours Okay, so uh, contact sensitive half life is not too much. So this is a favorable thing. Okay, so you see that's what I was telling you that it's being used oral, intramuscular, and nasal absorption is quite big. Okay, that's what I was telling you that nasal absorption is quite big. Okay, uh, these are some more points about it. Uh, you can have new here. Okay, so that's how uh, uh, dexmedetomidine is acting. This is the molecular level details. Okay, so actually this is what I was um, like. Uh, just a second. Okay. Um, what are the bradycardia, hypotension, respiratory depression? This is something. So this is something new for me because it does not cause respiratory depression. In whatever experience I have seen, actually the selling point of it is that it does not cause respiratory depression. This is something. Anyways, co-administration of dexmedetomidine with inhalational and in uh, intravenous anesthetic agents, benzodiazepine opioids will accentuate these effects. So if you, that's what I was telling you that if you are using because if you are using it separately, then the effect will be different. So what I did, I re removed benzodiazepine, of course, opioids I removed. And then I only use this inhalational agents and actually I come to know that even this is enough. But if you are using in a, like, for example, patient already had beta blocker and now you are trying to give it, there is literature, severe bradycardia leading to acestone. So that's why actually this is the problem. If you don't think, and don't, you don't categorize how much you should use and how you should use, this will be the thing which can create problems. So never try to overdose it. Okay, so this is the message which I want uh, all of you to know. Okay. So minimal change in ventilatory function, mild increase in respiratory rate, mild decrease in tidal volume, maintain hypercapnic drive and airway reflexes. This is the important point. That's what, that it does not cause respiratory uh, depression because I think this is there is some mistake here. It, it should not be like that because this is what is difference between if you are giving opioids or if you are giving benzodiazepine the problem will be that uh, uh, you will uh, have uh, uh, this usual response of CO2 and the uh, reflexes will be blunted. Okay. So this this is the the difference point with when you are using uh, uh, this uh, alpha two agonist this dexmedetomidine okay okay rousable sedation resembling natural sleep with preserved muscle tone and ventilation very good analgesia decrease cerebral blood flow and cerebral metabolic rate okay initial increase yeah, this is uh, this is something 
uh, uh, you will find uh, a number of things practically you will not see. So actually there is decrease in blood pressure, decrease in cardiac output due to heart rate. So there is much effect on heart rate rather than stroke volume. Okay. So this is the problem which, uh, which is there. Okay. So again, this is also contrast to what concept I have. I don't know because I don't think so. It has any effect on GI motility. I need to need to connect, uh, need to see in detail. Uh, decrease ADH activity on the DCT. Okay. Endocrine effect, adrenal suppression due to imidazole structure, not clinically significant. Decrease renin release, insulin release. So that is important for us. Okay. So the CN2 wean reduce rate by 25%, six hours further reduce of so because this is being used for uh, in the ICU. Uh, so because procedural sedation, it will be requiring more, more dose than what I told you. Uh, as uh, but again, I will tell you that if you have given more dose, there will be more chances of complications. So I never tried uh, separately because whenever you are using for even procedural sedation, you always combine it with propofol. So what I tell you that what experience I will share with you that I use it for uh, endoscopies and ERCPs. Without intubation, I proceeded a number of cases because if you are and not giving, uh, you are giving, for example, fentanyl and you are giving midazolam and now you have given paras, uh, propofol, usually that's, that's, uh, that, that's create problem for, uh, for us that in that way, the, the, the chances of airway uh, obstruction will be more. So then another thing is that when you are using like ERCP with, is, with the specific uh, reference to ERCP, the advantage is that, that opioids, they are affecting the sphincter of oditol. So this effect is there in it that it is uh, not causing that thing. And even I asked the, endo, uh, the, uh, the, the person who was doing endoscopy that I'm not using opioids and please let me know how, how is this effect. So in that cases, in those cases, which I did, actually they did not use uh, glucagon and they, or they did not ask us to give no, like they are in this, their routine that they keep, keep with them and they are giving glucagon or they are using some antispasmodic to relieve the, the, the this uh, increased tone. Okay. So in those cases, which I have personal experience, I told you that uh, the use of uh, without opiates, this advantage was there. Okay. I will, uh, I, I will have a look on this, this because I never read this article before. And uh, whatever concept I had is uh, more verbal than reading from the books and practical experience. Okay. So we will continue our discussion tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, we will discuss about uh, ketamine and uh, hopefully some points about uh, magnesium sulfate as well. Okay. So thank you very much. I hope you will you people also read some some words about it so that we 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 just learn something new. Okay. So thank you very much. Inshallah, we will meet tomorrow. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah.